In a world filled with uncertainty, two semi-intelligent, somewhat interesting, Midwestern, family guy, business coaches with dad bods, ooh, provide mildly insightful ideas through their semi-focused dialogue. Welcome to It Doesn't Take a Genius. Mark Ramsey. Mike Marshall. Where are we today? We, as we look around, virtually, would be in the, uh, yeah, that, oh, that's very convincing, in the Rocky Mountain National Park. And so in the background, there's little brown dots, and those are uh, just a, a herd of elk wandering past. And so, this, is, this is literally just a side road on the way to somewhere else in the park. So yeah. this is not even a not a trail, not a thing. It was just you're driving through the park and you go, "There's a herd of elk." <laughs> right. We don't have those in Indiana. We <laughs> should stop and look. So, and the way that you spot a herd of elk is you look for a herd of people with cameras. Yes. So, so if you see a herd of people, then nearby is a herd of moose. Uh, yeah, and I'm sure there's real words like a pod of moose, you know, <laughs> a, a clutch of elk. I don't know anything, but yeah, this was uh, this was what was happening, and it was just struck me as odd as this isn't even a named place. It right. looks this beautiful. It's just that pretty. Without a thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we did yeah. Yellowstone a few years back, and I know. I remember, I think it was bear jams. They call them bear jams when the traffic's just completely backed up. Mm -hmm. well, we're just waiting on some bears. We're all taking pictures or the bears are crossing the road and we're all stuck here until the bears decide what they want to do. So, oh, but, but yeah. just natural occurrence, just like that beauty behind us. So, yep. It was the same way in India. You had cow jams. <laughs> right. Yep. Yep. The cow wanders onto the interstate. Right. All stopped. Uh, right you know, and we wait patiently until he wanders off. you know some of those elk were brought to uh kentucky and uh, we're in a protected area as they tried to reintroduce elk into the appalachians and uh i do remember a few years back a guy uh hunting one really excited you know threw it over the hood of his car thinking he had bagged the biggest deer in the history of the world and the uh law enforcement had to get involved and explain to him what what he had done so yeah. Oops. Whoops. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, no, they're absolutely magnificent animals. Uh, yeah. yeah. Just to see them wandering around free. Pretty cool. Very cool. Well, I need your help. Um, I told you I had a story for you. I did not tell you the story. This is the deal. Um, I don't know if you know this, but I come from like a line of PhDs and you know, uh, uh, a, a bunch of smarties. And on the other side, I come from a line of um, you know, grade school dropouts. My, my papa, I, I think it was seventh grade, he dropped out and just hung out at pool halls and learned to play music really well and made a living at it, worked at the t-shirt factory and went on tour. Uh, just a brilliant musician, great mathematician in his head, you know, arithmetic was no problem, very smart guy, um, but, uh, but not educated. Right. And um, the opposite side, very educated. Um, interesting, they were into music too. So there's probably a connection there. Long and the short of it is I love learning. I love art. I love knowledge. I love all those things that I just mentioned, but I really need it connect, uh, need it to connect to the real world. So, you know, my, my smarty college educated dad and my Tennessee mountain woman mother, I, I have both of them in me. And so I've got a story for you, but I, I need you to help me connect it to the real world better than I've got it connected now. Awesome. Well, I come from a long line of moonshiners and ne'er do wells, so uh, we yeah. we share something in common then. Yes, yeah, so I understand completely. I also feel like I'm on an episode of whose line is it anyway? <laughs> so right. I have no idea what you're going to talk about. You talk about it, and I'll figure out. Hey, if that's interesting, uh, and what should we do with it? <laughs> and the points don't matter, right? Yeah, and the points don't matter. <laughs> Well, so I was at a luxury store, a luxury car dealership this week, and they're training a relatively new hire. She's very personable. Uh, she's very smart. Uh, she's very good with customers. Um, and now it's time to teach her about 
the finance and insurance products that we have at a dealership and teach her how to present those products to customers. Right. So, uh, so the story starts with uh, the sales manager and I meeting to talk about this. And he said, I like to do it one-on-one -on -one, and um, I've got her looking at a bunch of brochures. And so these brochures are complicated. Okay. The, the products are complicated. I mean, you know, this, we've both been in the business, you know, you, you buy this one, uh, wear and tear product. And if you lease, it will cover the first $500 worth of damage on your rims. Uh, but it won't include the installation of new rims, but it'll waive the fee if it's a lease and, you know, all these different complicated rules. So she has a lot to memorize and it's very complicated. And she comes in um, basically, uh, you know, armed with everything that she's been been taking in and trying to sort of get categorized in her brain. So I'm going to stop there and tell you the first thing that I thought of being the weird person I am is that this is, this is a great example of grammar. This is the grammar of the finance and insurance world. You know, the, you have to learn your, your letters, uh, your sounds, uh, the words, you have to memorize some things to be able to read. And she has been doing that soaking in these brochures and, and the various things they have at her disposal. So I witnessed the tail end of grammar being downloaded into this, uh, this salesperson. So I'm going to stop there and give you a chance to play whose line is it anyway. And, and what, what thoughts do you have as I throw that at you? Well, I think it's, it's interesting that, that when we talk about the automotive retail, uh, uh, we always talk about that it has its own language. Yes. And that, and that there's a, you know, it's just like the, the military is just like any other industry. First thing you have to do is learn the language. Yeah. And so, so many people will, you know, and even people that we hire to go into stores that maybe are, are tremendous coaches, but aren't familiar with automotive retail. The first thing that happens when they come out is they go, I have no idea what they're talking about. That's right. And so they, they come out and then once you bring them up to speed on the terminology, and the basic concepts, they immediately can tie it to something else. Yes. And go, oh, oh, that's like this in the medical field, and that's like this in the restaurant business. Yes. You know, so, so, so learning the terminology is the first step. Is 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 the first thing that has to happen, so I can even begin to understand, you know, the application and and everything like that. Well, it, you predicted where I'm going with the story because it was making those connections that was such a key part of what happened when she walked into the room because what he wanted to do was role play. Right. You know, he, he wanted to, to have a conversation with her about these various products. And you, you've experienced this. Anybody out there who's gone through role playing will know what I talk about here. Um, and I don't mean like, you know, I, I roll a six-sided die and, and cast a magic missile at the darkness. Um, and I, for what it's worth, I don't mean the safe word is banana. Uh, but this is role-playing in a corporate sense, uh, role-playing to teach how to sell this product. And um, it's awkward. Uh, you know, there are, there are false starts. You know, they, you start to say something, then you realize, no, that won't work. And you try to say something else. And meanwhile... What's happening is you thought you knew the grammar of the subject and you don't like you, you don't know it as well as you thought you did. And so there's this wrestling that goes on between the sales manager and the sales consultant. And she's doing a great job. She's very smart, but there just, there's no way to do role playing except through it being awkward. And sometimes if you're really lucky, it goes from awkward to, I'm going to say argument. Another sales manager walks into the room and he overhears one of the things that they're talking about. And he says, well, make sure that when you do this part that you say, blah, blah, blah. I won't go into all the details, but basically the, the other sales manager is saying, well, yeah. I, and, and the way we're doing that is blah, blah, blah. And they go back and forth a couple of times. And finally the sales manager that walked into the room goes, no, no, I don't think you understand. Let me say that again. And he listed out his points. And even the sales manager is going, ah, I see what you mean. And so in the course of doing this, what's happening is the sales consultant is connecting the products together and how they relate to each other. And she's also connecting how the presentation works with 
all of this knowledge that she has to internalize. So this is very similar to an, another thing uh, called dialectic. Uh, we're basically going through ancient Greek ways of, of, uh, of teaching. Uh, you would have a grammar of a subject, then you would have this dialectic, and you, know, you can probably hear in dialectic dialogue. And the idea is that you are truly wrestling with each other, but not for the sake of scoring points, right? Uh, to, to go back to our analogy of uh, whose line is it anyway, the point is to wrestle to the truth and get to the real heart of this so that you really know it and have it confidently on the inside of you that you've internalized uh, all this goodness that you're gonna you know, take out to the customer. So that's the second part of the story is you know, some awkwardness, some, some wrestling, even a little bit of an argument that this is the dialectic approach to, uh, to, to learning a new skill. What do, you, what do you take from that? But to me, the, the first thing I think of, as soon as you say role-playing, people recoil. Yes. Uh, hey, you know, and, and to me, role-playing is like getting a little kid to take a bath. I don't yeah. want to take a bath. I don't want to take a bath. And you pull and you drag him to the bathtub. Then you get him in the bathtub. You put him in there and then they splash around. And you're like, you need to get out of the tub. I don't want to get out of the tub. Right. Right. Because right. so you're playing. It's yeah, once you, playing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's playing, right? And, and people can see immediate process improvement. They can see development within themselves. They're Amen. like, okay, the first time I tried to say this, it sounded like the brochure. Yeah. And it, and it wouldn't, it doesn't sound like me. And it, it just wouldn't work in a real life game situation. And right. so, and so they, they talk it through and they, it, to me, it's, it's part of finding your voice. So I've, mm. I've got this information and now I need to, uh, you know, I need to know it into my heart. And, and then I need to be able to express it in a way that sounds natural and comfortable to me so that it will come across as authentic to whoever I'm presenting it to. Yeah. And so yeah. I always think of, of uh, soldiers when they come back from, from, from combat and things like that. And, you know, they're being interviewed and they said, what was it like? And they said, well, you know, when, the, when things got crazy, we knew exactly what to do because of our training. And oftentimes they will say that the training was harder than the actual combat. Yeah. So the scenarios they put me through and the questions they asked, you know, in this case, you know, the, 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 the physical rigors and the mental tests that we went through while we were role-playing combat, right. when we got to combat, it was easier because I had prepared, I had over-prepared. Yeah. And, yeah. And I was competent and ready for any contingency. So, right. so yeah, I can see where this is the the internalizing of of the information that we learned in the grammar stage. I love that, and uh, I have a friend. I think I brought this up maybe on the podcast. Uh, who's a tuba instructor, a college professor of tuba, and he has a saying that I assume is an actual Japanese expression: uh, "Cry in the dojo, laugh on the battlefield." And and that's what was happening. Is you know they were they were working this out, but but again third part of the story, the battlefield, right? So, um, so they're wrapping up this discussion and in the course of the discussion, it just became very clear that, you know, if you really, they didn't say these words, but they basically said, if you really care for your customer, you would present all of these products. You would not make any assumptions about what they want or need or can afford, God forbid, you know, that all these things that are pre-qualifying that are really, frankly, disrespectful, you're going to say, here's the menu. And they have this cool iPad that, you know, allows you to sort of move products around and see different price points for, for what you add. But the goal of providing this service, the, the finance and insurance products to people who need it and want it, you offer it to all. And they start talking about success stories. And so the sales manager, when, when he was a, a finance manager, he, he said that um, early on, you know, he had a, a customer and he was getting ready to just go into his pitch, blah, 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 and then this, and then this, and then this. And you start with the, you know, the, the most expensive option with all of the whistles and bells. And the, the customer interrupted him and said, yeah, we'll take that one. And he, he said, I, I didn't know what to do. Like I had to leave the room because I, I, oh, oh, you, you want this? Yes. Okay. 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 So, uh, there are success stories with just being able to present the information. He pointed out some other, uh, you know, success stories. There's a, a customer who uh, was a, a lawyer who works in the city and parks on the street on the sidewalk. Every two years he has a lease. 
every two years he buys a, a wheel care product because he knows he, and, it, and it's true, when he brings it in two years later, he scuffs up all four of those wheels. So just some, uh, so pointing out that, that there are some success stories here with presenting the information and learning the delivery. You know, it, it, they, they talked about in the COVID area, how do you, in the COVID era, how do you socially distance this presentation? You know, well, you've got this uh, iPad, you spin it around to them and let them play with it, step back and let them move things around to where they'd want to see it. All of these things around um, presentation and the arrangement of what you're presenting and having it memorized, these are all elements of uh, rhetoric. Uh, so so this, this ancient Greek and Roman art of presenting of, of be, you know, frankly, the art of speaking. And, and it only comes after the grammar and the dialectic, but you have this rhetoric that you offer others to influence them. It, it was used in ancient Greece and Rome for, you know, funeral orations and presenting to the courts and presenting to the legislature. That, that's what it was for. And in our day and age, it's used in the marketplace too. So there's my third part of the story. And I think it's amazing because one of the things that, that we hear all the time is if somebody's struggling uh, with sales success, service success, things like that, what we often find is they're skipping a step. Yeah. And so, you know, and they, and then it's sometimes it's, you know, the manager observes it and points it out to the team member. And sometimes the team member just self professes and go, you know, I haven't been presenting this and I've been skipping that. And I, I thought I knew, right. You hear that phrase. Oh, I thought good. I knew what the customer would want, wanted to do next. Yep. And, and, and then lo and behold, over time, they see an erosion of success. So good. And, yeah. So it's like, no, no, you've got to do it. All the stuff you got to yeah. do you know, all the steps and, and you can't assume the thing I've learned in, in my long period of time on the planet is I have no idea what anybody's thinking. <laughs> I have no idea what you're thinking or why you're doing what you're doing. Right. And typically when I find out why it is you're doing what you're doing or what it is you're thinking, I'm completely surprised. Like mm. I, I never even thought of it like that. I've never considered that part. That has never happened to me. I've yeah. never been in that situation. I wasn't raised that way. Right. It all comes into play. So, the best thing that you can do is not make assumptions based upon uh, what your beliefs are, because those beliefs are, are not the person across from you. So, so giving them all the That's options, right. allowing them to choose is, is kindness. Yeah. Uh, because if I withhold an option and it's the one that would have been best for them, then I'm being unkind yeah. uh, as a service provider. So, so, so yeah, let's, let's let them decide. And, and let's not skip any steps. So as we're wrapping up, I'm, I'm going to give you the counterpoint story. We've just gone over the three language arts that are, that are three of the seven liberal arts. These are the three called the trivium or the, the trivium, the three roads. Okay. And it, they're the language arts. That's why I used to people went to grammar school instead of elementary school, but grammar, dialectic rhetoric, these are, these are very, frankly, practical things that we've carried over from ancient Greece and Rome in how we educate. And it works in the business world too. Mm -hmm. What's fascinating is, you know, it involved playing. It involved um, really making sure we're doing what's best for the other people involved, you know, presenting all the products, et cetera, et cetera. We don't know what they're thinking. We're trying to learn from their perspective. Counterpoint story. I don't know what the Russian education system was under the Soviet era, but we have some Russian friends. My wife just told me this, that they were talking about piano lessons. And she said, I'm uh, the, the, the mother of this family. She said, I'm having to be really careful that I don't let my Russian tendencies come out here because my grandmother, I only heard play three times in my life. And apparently she had been part of a Soviet training, you know, think Russian gymnasts and all that stuff. She went to a classical piano training system and was very good and hated it. You know, right. she just had it drilled into her, drilled into her, drilled into her. And uh, she said she, she heard her, her uh, grandmother maybe three times her whole life play and play very reluctantly and very well, but she didn't want to do it. And I just think about the, the trivium, you know, what, what this 
dealership offered this employee is something that's going to really last her lifetime. You know, it's, it's, it's just what you said. I'm learning to think about other people and, and uh, see it from their perspective. I'm learning ways to speak to others, to communicate more effectively. I'm learning I can do this, frankly. Mm-hmm. Um, so there are, there are all these, um, these side benefits uh, that, are, that are frankly lifetime opportunities if managers are willing to, to take their people through these, what I would call steps at least, you know, to your point. Uh, we've got to give them a grammar of the subject. We've got to uh, give them a chance to play with it and have a dialectic and it's going to get weird and awkward and, and possibly argumentative. But the goal is rhetoric that we, we take care of, of the people in front of us and communicate clearly with them. Mm-hmm. Well, I think the, the uh, one other point to make is it needs to happen in that order. Yeah. You know, so many managers you meet now, they're like, well, I had them watch a video on, yeah. on presenting this product. And then when they're in front of a customer, they're terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, you skipped a step or right. we just, we didn't have them learn anything and just put them in front of a customer going, yeah, this is common sense, you know, just, yeah, yeah, they should be able to, you know, and then they're struggling and they're going, well, this guy's not very bright. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Obviously he's not the man for the job. And it's like, yeah. No, you skip the steps. You did, yeah. you, and and you, you didn't, if you did do the steps, you didn't do them in order. Right. Because sometimes they find out, well, he's not very good with customers. Let's train him. Yes. No, no, that's the wrong order. Right. It's yes. just, you know, so, so I think, you know, following a path here uh, is, is good business and it's kindness to your employees, kindness to the people that you're, you're, you're overseeing. Thank you for connecting the dots for me. I feel better about the fact that I really like this ancient Greece stuff. Thank you. Well, thank you for sharing because yes, my my knowledge of ancient Greek is extremely limited uh, <laughs> to a, you know a couple of fables and and Medusa. So that's all I got. <laughs> and Harry Hamlin and Clash of the Titans and that's yeah okay yeah. got it. Yeah yeah that's pretty much you know if, if it wasn't for uh, uh, Harryhausen I would have no idea about any of that. So. <laughs> Ooh, nice name drop. Thanks. All right, let's let's see what our announcer has to say today. Hmm. And that, I guess, is that. It doesn't take a genius. No rights reserved, nothing trademarked, copyrighted, or even original. Feel free to give it to anyone, anytime, using any and all media formats. Warning, Mark and Mike may or may not make another one. I'm your announcer, and I did not get paid a nickel to do this. They won't even let me tell you my name. So until next time, if there is a next time, stay safe. Be well. That's good enough.